I open the floor now for questions. Uh, Mr. Hamza, I believe you want to say something. Yes, thanks a lot, Shivani. And uh, I, I just th those presentations were excellent. I just thought I'd, I'd reflect a little on on some of the uh, points that Professor Hanebier made in his presentation. Uh, I, I cannot emphasize more. A, a treaty is only as useful as its implementation and as its enforcement by by governments all across the world. Um, w when it comes to the Cape Town Convention and its aircraft protocol, the reason that, that more and more states uh, have been adopting it all over the world is, is because it works. So the insolvency mechanism within the Cape Town Convention and the aircraft protocol does provide for cheaper access to finance for uh, debtors all across the world. And, and, and that's why the treaty now has 82 contracting states and the aircraft protocol has 79. All of the economic benefits that I talked about, whether those be for airlines, whether those be for lessors, only uh, come into play if the treaty is being applied properly by any state that's suggested that they will, that, that, that has agreed to apply it. And uh, many of the benefits, so for example, when I talked about the OECD discount, on uh, or the OECD aircraft sector understanding, which allows for airlines sometimes to buy airplanes at as much as a 10% discount from, from regular rates. So if you find that the states uh, and airlines and, and operators within states that are eligible for such a discount are only those that have implemented the Cape Town Convention properly and have made the subsequent declarations that they need to make. And, and, and so I can only press on, on what Patrick said, that, that implementation is a key element to any treaty system, whether that be the Cape Town Convention, the Aircraft Protocol, or, or conventions and treaties in, in other aspects of, of the law. And, and as a secretariat, uh, as, as an international organization, when a state does sign on to one of our treaties, we're, we're always available to help government officials understand the treaty better and, and, and implement it to the fullest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hamza. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Abad. Um, yes, okay. uh, can I, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, I think uh, as a response to actually both uh, Professor Patrick Honeyburn and then uh, uh, Mr. Hamza, uh, especially with respect to the case of uh, Lalit Modi, uh, I agree with both of you that the international conventions like the Cape Town Convention has to be implemented in the right spirit for the purpose of uh, Having the uh, having the trade of confidence growing in terms of the mobile equipment, equipment financing, uh, but in the Indian level, one of the unique things is that we have a parallel to the asset-based financing as you find under the Cape Town Convention in the municipal level as well. That is the system of hypothecation. We have a system of hypothecation which is also rooted in the domestic level. And what is what is happening in uh, this hypothecation is that. If there is a conflict between the state interest as well as the creditor interest, then the state interest has, has uh, taken superiority over the creditor in, uh, interest in many of the instances. Probably in the same logical analogy, it's also being extended to the asset-based financing under the Cape Town Convention. Since in Lalit Modi's case, there are multiple issues, like there are issues regarding uh, 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 having a sham company being established. There is also an issue regarding the evasion of the customs duty. So the state is also having an its interest uh, with respect to his asset. So therefore, it's a conflict between the interest of the creditor or the lesser on the one hand and the state on the other hand. And probably the state is giving preference to the uh, uh, the state interest. But I, mean, I, I, I completely agree with you that the, the system has to be changed unless and until we respect the international treaty obligations. Might, maybe the financing might not uh, come forward. So that's why I agree with you. Thank you, Professor Sandeepa. Can I uh, respond? Yes, Professor Honeybeer. Yeah. Or is it somebody else? Can I respond, uh, please? Yes, Professor Honeybeer. Yes, can I respond? Yes, of course. Okay, uh, first of all, I'm sorry why my presentation, why I couldn't see all of you. It is very odd to talk to a wall when you see nobody faces, so you can't see whether it comes over all right, whether people understand what you're saying. <laughs> 
that is very strange and as if i'm talking to myself uh that's uh but now i can see you again fully all of you i have no clue what happens but it is perfect but anyway uh my colleague mr hamid hamza uh of course we do agree uh to a very very large extent and uh i also uh agree with others but you see first of all there is no aviation industry without aircraft financing these days. I mean, it is like we need homes. In most countries, you go to a bank and you get a mortgage or you rent a home. What can you do without your home? Uh, that is the first step in the chain of events uh, in the international aviation world these days. Uh, most airlines are privatized. They're no longer state controlled. The money doesn't come from the taxpayer. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Air India is one example, but it's, um, unfortunately, it's not the best as far as finance is concerned because it is almost belly up. So, uh, I can mention more. So, what I'm trying to say is that you have to go and get money from the private sector and um, that is why the treaty is so important and not only to accommodate the private sector uh, finance sector the lease industry aircraft lease engine lease uh, more than 50 percent of engines are leased today uh, but you must accommodate them but not only them but if they get secured rights like your bank at home for your house they will be able to provide you like Hamza is saying with better rates you can get discounts and everything else and everything else and that is what that treaty is trying to achieve okay however there are worst case scenarios and I was only addressing one of the private aircraft but at least 40 cases exist right now I'm sure I cannot um, tell you look at this 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 no, I don't have the time for that, but similar cases exist and COVID only made it or makes it worse, makes it worse. So we need to do something about it. And in the worst case scenario, you cannot argue anymore. Our local laws, national laws have this to say, our sovereignty that to say in trade and industry there are equal parties and also the states involved act as equal parties as the stakeholders they must provide services uh, they must do their homework they must implement the treaty not only this one but others too and if they don't do that the industry is suffering so i argue and my country argues with me that other states can say okay you do in your country for example india what you want you've got your issues you've got your laws we have got ours and we are just as sovereign as you are so we can do and we obeyed two treaties to Chicago, we obeyed to Cape Town. That is what I'm trying to say. So something has to be done at issues like uh, the ones I am talking about. Something has to be done. You can't go on for push, push, push and say, for example, India or other countries, you must do this, you must do that, and you must do this, and they don't. India ratified the treaty 12 years ago, for goodness sake. So, and it's not only this treaty, I'm sure, in trade and industry. Thank you, Shivani. Thank you so much, Professor Hanabir. Uh, uh, if, uh, if everyone is okay, I would like to address the next question. Uh, the next question is to Professor Patrick Honnebier. And the question is, uh, uh, it would be wonderful if you could please shed some light on the career prospects of studying international aviation financing and leasing laws uh, as to what would be the possible areas of dispute. Uh, what do you mean by the issue of dispute? Is there uh, a what, dispute? Uh, no, uh, the question is basically what could be the possible areas of dispute in something like aviation financing? 
well, I'm still confused about the term dispute. But first of all, uh, as far as I read the, the question, uh, you see, I already said that aircraft financing really these days is important. Uh, we can't do without it anymore. That's that's a matter of fact. Uh, so there is a lot of work for the students. Uh, that's what I read also in, in, in the long question. Uh, what can students do with aircraft financing and leasing laws when they go to law school? Um, what I would like to say is that um, uh, it is in an important aspect, it is a small world. It is not as big as the liability uh, in aviation, passenger rights and everything else and everything else, but it is significant because without money there are no passenger rights because there are no aircraft and there are no crashes and there is no competition and we don't need airports. So what I'm saying is aircraft financing is divided in two chunks. The first one is, okay, it goes well, like in good days, in the good days, there are a lot of transactions, all the airlines need new aircraft, modern aircraft, and they need to be financed. So in those days when sky is literally the limit for uh, the airlines and for the financiers and lessors, that's what we do in practice in the international aviation finance and lease practice. We do that kind of work, transactional work, transactional work, a lot, a lot. When it goes well, incredible, there are not enough aircraft and they all have to be financed. Okay, or to the majority. All right, and then the downturn, 2001, September 11, 2008, uh, economic recession worldwide. Uh, today, COVID, we turn the table in our group, uh, the aircraft finance and lease industry, law, lawyers, we turn the table. We work for our clients. How do we repossess? How do we get back the assets? How do we uh, try to make the best of it? Yeah, for the lessors, for the financiers. And at the same time, it is also needed that the lessees, the operators, the airlines are profiting, uh, benefiting from it. So basically, in this area of aviation law, yeah, I don't promise a rose garden, but uh, yeah, there is always work. It's either good weather or bad weather. And one of my colleagues ever said, uh, you know, this is uh, a lawyer's paradise, this kind of work, this situation, all the problems arising in this area of aviation law. One of them, he said, this is not my quote, it's a lawyer's paradise, which is the equivalent of the client's depression. That's it. <laughs> So Thank you, Professor I don't, I don't promise the paradise, understand? I don't promise a rose garden, but yeah, there is work usually. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patrick Honnabier. I believe uh, Mr. Hamza wants to make a comment. Thanks a lot, Giovanni. Uh, building on to what, what uh, Patrick just said, when it comes to the question of disputes in aircraft financing, very often, it, it's largely due to the very nature of the aviation industry, right? It's a very international agency uh, industry, and, and it relies a lot upon cross-border transactions. And, and, and a major area of dispute, or, or certainly the problem that the Cape Town Convention looks to resolve, is the applicability of different types of laws within different jurisdictions. So if an aircraft being financed, let's say, in, in country X, and the financiers in country Y, then then the fact that different rules apply in both those countries make it really hard for financiers to lend with confidence. And uh, especially in times of crisis, so for example, with, with the COVID crisis, like, like uh, Professor Hanabier mentioned, all countries across the world have come up with different types of rules to protect debtors within their own uh, jurisdiction. Some countries have developed rules which offer greater levels of security and protection for debtors, whereas others have had instances where governments themselves have stepped in to assist airlines with paying off their debt. And, and it's these differences in rules that more often than not lead to conflict because, and, and it's these differences in how rules are applied by courts that sometimes add on to the conflict. And, and 
when it comes to things that students can study and things that lawyers can do, lawyers, of course, have the best, uh, the, the best outcome for their client in, in their minds, whereas legislators and uh, people who study the law will, of course, sometimes think more towards what's the best outcome for the overall system. And, and, and that's certainly an area that, that students can explore and, and, and look at how we can draw synergies between what works best in practice and what works best in theory. And, and, and that's certainly what we try our best to do, sort of bring forward legal reform that fits the needs of the industries without dis discouraging or putting anyone else in a bad position. Thank you. Hamza, you were leaving out that you also need good lawyers. You said courts and everything else, and <laughs> but there are major, major, major cases, and I'll only mention one. That is the Blue Sky, uh, Mahan Air. That is Blue Sky English, Mahan Air, Iran. Also uh, direct the Netherlands, New York, Armenia. One case, 2010, major, major English case major English major case for the whole world, uh, uh, the whole aviation world, it was messed up by the lawyers from the Netherlands and England. The court didn't have to take this disastrous decision. It was just argued terribly. So you need good lawyers too. <laughs> Thank you, 49 million dollars down the drain. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, with this, we come to an end to the session as well, uh, the last session for today. Uh, I would uh, once again extend my gratitude to all the uh, speakers in this session, Mr. Hamza Hamid, uh, Professor Patrick Honnabier, uh, Dr. Uh, Moses George, and Dr. Uh, Ledudis. Thank you so much for speaking to us and for sharing your insights on uh, your topics.